Hello. Today, I have Sister Carolyn with us. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I could not wait to hit record because I have never spoken per se with Sister Carolyn in this aspect. And so a lot of her comments have been not only thought provoking, but spiritual. And when I say spiritual, they're not only in line with the word, she'll also comment where is it at in the word. And so picking up with that thought, we're just gonna speak about relationships, different aspects of relationships and two that jump out to me that you've alluded to and we somewhat discussed before I began recording is one, the aspect of forgiveness in relationships. And then two, the aspects of just what are standards for different types of relationships when it comes to single saved individuals. And when I say saved, people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, such as yourself, such as myself, how does the Bible say we should live? So let's jump right in there because you said you had learned something about being single and saved. So let's hear that again. Yes. So what I have found in the, what I have found in the churches, people, you know, men, they, they say one thing and they live their life one way in public and then they live their lives another way in private. And so in dating, because I've dated men that's both been in the church and out of the church. And what I find the issue of sex is like a big thing. And, and, and men in the church, I find it more, <laughs> I find it more difficult dating in the church. Because you say, at me as a woman, I will say, I'm not going to have sex before I'm married. And a lot of men, they don't believe it when you say that. When you say, I'm committed. I love the Lord enough to suppress my fleshly desires to be intimate with someone. They have a tendency not to believe that. And so there are times to where... I have dated someone and I have made that statement and that caused a rip in our relationship because I love me, Carolyn. I love God more than I love myself. But what that person didn't seem to understand, I loved you enough not to bring that sin into your life also. And so therefore we didn't agree on that and we, we grew apart. And at the same time, you know, that person was trying to use my gifts, my talents in God to pursue his dreams. And I'm like, no, I, you can't have this because this is what God has given me and poured into me for my husband's that my husband that is coming. I cannot compromise my walk with God to be with someone like that. I will not. I will not. I don't care how much money you have, what you can do or you can't do for me because God is my provider. He's going to provide for me. And a lot of times women, they get married really quickly in the church because they hold on to that scripture that Paul says, it's better to marry and not to burn. But did you burn before? I mean, were you intimate with this person? before you married and that and, and that and that comes from your teaching i heard this morning and i thought about that a lot of times you know you're right when you said a lot of relationship falls apart and divorce happens because of that sin we introduced into that relationship i have to love god more i have to love you as my potential husband more before i love myself so therefore me as a woman of faith and belief, I can't introduce that into your life. And a lot of men, they don't understand that. So 
listening to what you had to share and delving a little bit more off into the details. First, I'd like to address the fact that you said that this gentleman who was a man of God mm -hmm. and you said that a few gentlemen who were men of God, it has been your experience that sex is a really big issue for Very. single men mm -hmm. in the church and that when a woman in the church, we're speaking about in the church, mm -hmm says no to sex before marriage, that is a big problem with men and we, because I'm a man, generally don't believe that statement. And so my response to that, based upon I have not always been saved. Mm -hmm. And so my mentality at one point in life was such. And so I just wanna look at that from maybe his standpoint, but where I was at, when I would hear a woman in church Although I was not in a relationship with God and I'm going to church, I want to qualify this again. I was not in a relationship with God, but I was attending church because I knew it was the right thing to do. That was the way I was raised. And so when I would run into women in the church and we would date or we would call or whatnot, and the subject comes up and, and they may say, or they said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to wait till I'm married. I would not believe them based upon the fact for me to have gotten to the point, no matter how quickly or how long, that I've introduced the suggestion or made an attempt to have sex with the woman. There had to be some signs. There had to be some things that she was saying, doing, or that I misinterpreted to even pursue that. And so when, I, when I'm saying this from a male perspective, the reason for me, a lot of times in that form of life, you're saying one thing, but I'm seeing something else and seeing something else is not necessarily seeing it for what it is. Mm -hmm. But as a man, and when Christ is not the head of my life or I am not intimately involved in allowing Christ through his word, through his people to speak with me, then my flesh or that inner person, you can be smiling because the Holy Spirit has filled you up and blessed you and you favored. But what my flesh sees is, oh, you giggling. She giggling. She, she, okay, she, she likes that. When you give me a compliment, just affirming me as a man. Right. Oh, I like your strength, or I like this, or I like that. My flesh hears, oh, okay, she, she went from Holy Spirit and brother, you know, what's this scripture then? Oh, it's physical now. And I'm just, just bringing that out to say some men, because they are not being purposeful in their relationship with God, the natural man inside of them is reading everything you're doing to say she wants me because that is truly you know where the word says to the pure all things are pure i'm already crooked on the inside meaning i'm already full of lust and so your actions even though they may not be lustful actions i'm going to interpret those as lustful actions when i'm not listening to the holy spirit right so <laughs> I'm just, I'll be truthful and honest, for, honest. So women play that game. You know, we play that. It, it's true. We play that game. We play that game of flirting. We do. We play that game of, we have to be honest with ourselves. We do. We do at times do stuff to make that man feel as if we are interested in having sex with him. We do because as a woman, you want to feel desired by someone. And so we have a tendency to be flirty or even say, you know, inappropriate things that may give him the wrong idea. We are guilty of that. And in the church and out of the church, people won't admit that. And so 
you know, you have to walk a fine line. I tell people, don't do something that gives this man the wrong idea. You want that person a part of your life, but you have to love the word that's inside of him more to stop that type of behavior because we're taught as women from a young age, you know, you bat your eyes at him, you grin, you know, you slightly rub against his body to keep his interest in you. Even though you have no intentions of sleeping with him, we do do that stuff to try to keep that man interested in us. But then we start to open up other doors. And so what, I, what I've heard because as we discuss these things, we, we're going to provide some answers that have worked for you and worked for me. What I've heard that works for you is loving God more than you love the desire for a man. Is that correct? That's correct. And for me, from a male perspective, just trying to lend some help to some men we must continue to develop our relationship with Christ because the day that we don't, we will automatically lean to that default of a man desires a woman. There's mm -hmm. nothing, there's nothing, there's no sin in a man desiring a woman. But when that woman is not his wife and the thoughts begin to go in a direction that should only be between a man and a woman when they are married, then that relationship with Christ, the Holy Spirit will bring to my attention or bring to a gentleman's attention and say, you're getting carried away. Mm -hmm. Well, this might be, okay, it might be her, but let's play the whole tape. Until we get the might out of it, I shouldn't be undressing her in my mind. Until we get the might, and even if I say she is mine, she's not mine until we do consummate that marriage. Mm -hmm. Situations and things happen, and I just refer back to Mary and Joseph in the Bible. Bottom line, Joseph was about to get rid of this woman for doing nothing but following what God had for her. Why are you saying that example? How does it tie in, Sean? I'm saying things can happen. Things can happen. Good people can be good people, but they might not be meant to be married one to another. Right. And so that's that's just something that I'm glad we're able to share here. And just on another level, just getting all the way into the church. What about the woman or the man, the bottom line? You've been slipping, you've been dipping, you have been having sex, but every time you have sex, you want to run to God and ask for forgiveness. Good thing, good thing. Brother Oliver is saying, any sin that does not lead to death, confess that sin. But to provide them help, I'll speak to the men first, to provide some men some help. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is obviously your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God as a man, that alone you have not allowed to be sufficient to stand. And so what I would suggest is an accountability partner. And let me be very careful when I share this with you. The bottom line is, it's going to be hard to find another man who is not caught up in the church with what you are. Meaning, in my mind, out of my mind, man, I'm not a whoremonger, but you know, I'm a man, man. I, just, I gotta, you know, I gotta do what I need to do. And I'm telling you that your relationship with God is enough. But since you have not allowed it to be enough, the same way you seek out information from other men who are slipping and dipping and doing what they do, seek out some counsel from some men who don't. And it might not be a single man. It might be a married man because married men are tempted also. And so that's just my encouragement to them. And out of my own story, I would say without Christ Jesus, I wouldn't even be having this conversation. So I'm not even going to play with anybody watching this. I go to church all I want to. And I'm talking about me. I go to church. They saved. 
they saying this, they saying that. The bottom line, I'm ruled and reigned by my flesh. But since Christ has come into my life, not because I don't have eyes, not because I don't have ears, not because I don't smell things that smell nice, but the only thing that keeps me is a daily inspection with God concerning my relationships with the opposite sex. Meaning, no, I can't skip a day. No, I can't sit up and say, well, I haven't done this and I haven't done that. And whoa, it's been decades. I can't do that. I'm saying I. But when I continue to keep myself before the throne concerning what I watch, what I listen to, who I talk to, how long I talk to her, why am I looking forward to talking to her? I'm just giving you what keeps me. And so I'm not saying I don't have accountability partners, but I'm saying my relationship with God has been good. And he's done enough in my life that I know that every little thing, whether somebody else thinks it's little or not, whether somebody else thinks it's embarrassing or not, I know when I take that to Jesus, he's been able not only to handle that, he's handled it well. Right, right. And for, for me, it's that full submission and surrender to God. That's key. And you have to have that desire in you to want to be kept, to want to be whole and preserved because we bring a lot of baggage into these relationships. So you have to surrender all that past hurt and pain because sometimes we have sex out of that pain. That's that comfort that we need. And so I find that once I fully and truly surrendered, those desires, they started to become less and less in my life. And I cannot take counsel from my friends out in the world. I cannot take counsel from my friends that are, that are in church that are teaching preaching and engaging in that type of behavior. I know this is something that she is struggling with. So when I have my struggle, I can't go to her and say, hey, but I have to have, I have people in my life, women in my life, who's believing for a husband that's saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, have that relationship with God. And we have to, and they have to keep me accountable. You, you, you know you're going on a date tonight. So you know you can't wear this, that, or the other to cause him to touch you inappropriately. Or you know you can't get too close to that person because, and we go over this, like every time I go on a date, you can't be so close to him to where, you know, you can feel his body heating, you can feel, and he can feel yours because then that's gonna open up doors. You always have to first and foremost put God first. Then you, as a human being, have to be aware of your actions, how you engage with these men. Because I promise you, I promise you, if you put yourself in a situation, you will slip. You have to, you have to do your part. But most, I mean, for me, my love for God and my love for people is so great to where I don't want to bring sin into their lives. I, I'm transparent. I have been guilty of that. I have in the church, serving in the church, working in the church, had loved the Lord, but I was having sex and I was not married. You see what I'm saying? And I would be convicted and I would be remorseful about it and I would feel bad. And it was, and the Lord was telling me, you're putting yourself in a situation to where you're causing that person to fall. And he's putting you in a situation where he's causing you to fall. You have to love each other 
enough and you have to love me more not to bring sin into each other's lives you know people only look at look at it from the aspect of an alcoholic if you're around an alcoholic you won't drink but i can't have and put myself in situations to where i'm gonna cause myself and someone else to have sex out of the will of god i, I just can't do that and you know and a lot of people they don't admit it they they won't the church does not talk about sex you know they, they will not discuss this and it, and it taints and then what happens is if you've had sex with that person and you stop having sex with that person they take that as a form of rejection and then that's when bitterness and animosity starts to build up and everything falls apart now you're walking in unforgiveness because maybe he went outside the relationship and had sex with somebody else or that woman went outside the relationship and had sex with somebody else because the two that began the walk as equal one has grown and the other one has not and now you have this big blow up and this big chaos going on inside of you now it's overflowing into the church and now you're walking in in unforgiveness of each other and you're mad at each other and you're hating each other but you have to set all that aside you have to forgive mm -hmm. and once you submit and you surrender you forgive each other. And if it's meant to be, it'll be. And if it's not, you have to understand that and go your separate ways. I, I, see, I see where God, God is taking us. We wanted to, when I say we wanted to, we discuss speaking about unforgiveness. And so many times when unforgiveness is preached, it's because somebody offended us in a word or Mm -hmm. a deed like they took something or, or, or they said something inappropriate but what I'm saying and what I believe is being drawn out in this interview is I personally this is my personal opinion mm -hmm. one thing I constantly tell the men that are in my life that are saved I said bro the reason that I don't think sex is spoken about in the church and do I understand that in a pulpit where there may be teenagers and this, that, and the other, that the pastor may not be able to go into detail about the subject. I do, but it seems in 2021, every pastor wants people to have Bible studies throughout the week at their homes, however they want to title it, community group or Bible study or leadership conferences. And this is where these things need to be spoken about. But I share with them, I said, listen, bro, when you see some people saying stuff like this. Oh, brother, the Lord is enough. I don't know what you got going on this, that, and other. I see it. Some of the people who are the most adamant about how much they dislike people who sin sexually in the church are in the deep recesses of their hearts, really running from the fact they want to do it. Mm -hmm. if, if that wasn't clear enough, I'm saying I personally have run into many individuals who are men who will speak against sex before marriage, but they speak against it with a sword in their hand. Mm -hmm. And when I get one-on-one -on -one with these men, I say, bro, if you're so mad about that sin, you might really want to check and examine, do you really want to do what he's doing? Mm -hmm. What you mean by that, brother? Meaning so-and-so is sleeping around the church. You're upset at him. You're trying to have him removed. You're trying to have him rebuked. But is it the Lord or is it the fact you really want to run around and have sex, but you have built up enough conviction where the Holy Spirit just won't let you get all the way out there in that manner. And so you're mad at him because of that. And you say, well, how did you come to that conclusion, Sean? Because when you say you hate sin, you don't pick and choose which sins you hate. So when you uh, yeah, he doing that and she doing that and you see how she dressed your comment on the surface is met with agreement by most, mm -hmm. but the results being the divorce rates, the men in the church who we see each other, bro, everything that passed by you looking at. Right. And, 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 you know, and people don't want to call people out on that. I don't want to say, I'm not going to say anything to you because it may hurt your feelings and we may not be friends anymore, but 
I, like I said, I've been blessed. I have a group of people in my life, male and female. Carolyn, that's wrong. You know, you're, you know, you can go from zero to 10 in a hot second. You, you know, you need to, you know, and that's something I've been working on. But people don't want to call people out. But a lot of times they don't call people out. Because secretly, while they're condemning it to others, okay, we they're doing it them, themselves. I, I may be married, but I got this girl. And then, and then this is what I noticed, too, about a lot of men in the church. They will get a woman that's not churched. They will, not, they will get a woman that is not walking with the Lord because she's not going to call him out on his behavior. One, because she does not know the word. And then two, he's fulfilling what she needs. So, you know, a lot of times when I run into people like that, they're guilty of doing that. You're committing the same sin that you're talking to your brother about. But we are called, we are called to correct each other. The word says iron sharpens iron. We got to learn to, you know, say, hey, that's not right. Don't do that. You know, you're married. Stop looking because Jesus says to look at a woman with lust. You've already committed adultery in your heart. So, you know, we have to be like, we have to be accountable to one another. And a lot of people, and a lot of people, that's why they don't fully surrender because they don't want to be accountable to God. I got that relationship with God, but I'm not going to let this go because I'm not going to be fully accountable. True. And so one way that I attempt to help some individuals like this is just <laughs> have honest conversations mm -hmm. and make sure, make sure that my conversation, let me be clear when I say this, mm -hmm. I make sure that my conversation is not condemnation. Yes. Because Love. I said what I've witnessed, mm -hmm. but I know, but for the grace of God, I'll end up doing the same thing. Meaning because I can see your eyes moving because mm -hmm. I can see your head turning. You just not slick with it. Right. I need to make sure. Okay. Sean, she passed by. I'm sorry. You didn't look. But when you did look, the third time, what is that? What, you, that's, that, that's that lost in time. Honest, you have, when I say the third time, it's okay. I'm just using an example, but I'm not being offensive. You pass by, you seem attractive. Oh, that's an attractive woman. I go on with the conversation. Church is over. I decide I want to look around the sanctuary and see, are you still here? I'm not taking my thoughts captive. I'm just, man, I just want to, was she this, was she that? That's the second time. Now I'm in the parking lot. And all I need to do is go get in my vehicle. I've talked to everybody I'm going to talk to. But I, where is she at again? Me, I'm saying me. I have to be very specific when mm -hmm. I examine my thoughts. And so my thoughts, when I get in my vehicle, I'm talking about Sean. Mm -hmm. Why did it matter to you? I'm going to skip the second. I'm going to get right to the third where you can't make any excuses. I'm talking about me. Mm -hmm. I was looking for this lady in the party. Never spoke to her. Didn't undress her. But what is motivating me to look again before I get in my vehicle to see could I see her again? And these are just the kind of conversations that have helped me have an avenue with other men because they like, man, you, you serious? You do it like that? I say, bro, let's not play. Why would I, if I just said that to you, man, I thought about it once, I thought about it twice, I thought about it three times. Even if you're not dissecting that, there's going to be some in your mind like, why would you think about that three different times? Because when you walked in the door and the deacon was at the door or the stewardess was at the door and they said, God bless you this morning, brother Oliver. It's good to see you. I didn't think twice about it. Went straight into the sanctuary. Here I go. Out the sanctuary, here I go. But all I did was see her. And so I'm just saying when I'm transparent like that with other men, then the stuff begins to come out. And I'm not a, I'm not one who 
condemns me, bro, that's wrong. But how can we help each other? Because you're telling me about it. So I'm not going to act like I know everything. And I might find out something that you don't do that I do that can help me. And so something that helps me is just to have honest conversations with men who have problems by first discussing my problem. That's just a way that I have found to bring about correction because I'm not, uh, I'm not sinless. No, I'm not doing what you're doing. And yeah, God has blessed me in some instances to be able to speak on some things. But what I do for Sean Oliver is I look for things in my life that are flawed to be able to open up the conversation because then you understand that I'm not coming to you with a finger pointed. I'm coming to you like, say, brother, this is what I do with myself. You want to talk about anything you got going on? What about you? That's what I do too. I mean, I point my finger at myself first. I examine me first. Carolyn, why are you allowing this? Why are you exhibiting this type of behavior? What is wrong and broken in you that you feel like you can do this, right? That's what I say to myself. Mm -hmm. And then I sit down and I examine at the moment, what do I have going on in my life that may be pushing me towards something that God would not have me to do? Because it's not always necessarily something that happened in the past. It could be something that's happening in the present. And at one time, this particular habit or this particular behavior soothes what was going on in me. And so now I'm not turning to God immediately when this issue is arising. I'm looking for that thing that I know that may comfort me in that moment. And so I have to be careful with myself and I have to be honest with myself. This is happening in your life. You're stressed. You got a lot going on. This is what you are used to doing for comfort, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so it has presented itself right there at that moment and that time because I'm weak at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so I have to stop myself. I have to say, no, I can't. This is not how God wants it to be. I cannot do this. I cannot cling to that which I know. I have to turn to my father and cling to him more to get me, because it's a moment by moment walk. I have to cling to him more in this moment of desire and wanting and loneliness in order to not pick up that phone and call that person or not to, you know, do whatever it is that my flesh is desiring. So, you know, I tell people, we have to be careful. We have to be careful because you can have a bad day and the wrong person call your phone and you and slip back into a behavior that God has brought you out of. And I always have to always be aware. I have to be aware what I allow my mind to think about. I have to be aware to where I set my heart towards. And so, you know, it's not easy. I tell people it's not easy, but it's getting, it, it, it's become, God has allowed me to see what triggers that part of me. So I've learned to not focus on things. If I find myself struggling, I'm like, Lord, you know, you say that I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm blessed, I'm anointed, I'm appointed. You have delivered me. Jesus died on the cross that this may not hold me bound anymore. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. And you have to be honest with God because if you be like, okay, Lord, I'm gonna get over this. No, I'm struggling. I'm struggling in this moment, in this time. I need you to do something to snap me out of this moment. And I promise you, he does it every time. Somebody, one of my friends will call me that's saved, you know, that's walking with God or somebody or, or, or 
something will happen and I get distracted and I'm no longer thinking about that. You know what I'm saying? No, so you have to you have to be aware of your triggers. If you not, you lying to yourself. I can't sit up and listen. I, I listen to R and B music. I can't listen to certain songs. I can't listen to Luther Van Drops. I can't listen to him because that's gonna bring up those emotions. Okay. I'm by myself and I need to be, you know, you can't do that. I can't listen to Luther. I can't, Luther, I can't listen to you. I can't listen to you. And then, so that's when I say, uh, let me put on some gospel music because I need some right now because I'm going to go down this road that I don't want to go down. And you have to, you know, you can't watch television shows, you know, to where there's a lot of intimacy between men and women. You can't do that. You know, I can't watch Stella because the TV off and go do something else. You have to recognize what your triggers are because what triggers me may not trigger the next person. But you have to be aware and you have to, and I tell people, I I have to go, Lord, I have to start praying right then in that moment. Lord, help me, deliver me, send somebody, have somebody to call me, you know, do something because I'm going to fall. And I don't want to fall. And he does that for me. And I don't think people are truly honest with God when they ask for stuff. Woo-wee! Sister Carolyn, the thought that comes to my mind in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, the Bible says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice the bottom line in our christian lives especially in relationships not just with the opposite sex but right now i want to say with the opposite sex we have some challenges we face some disappointments we go through different things and if we are not careful we become bitter rather than better and i'm not saying better in the sense of a worldly viewpoint i'm saying better in the sense of maturity and so if there's anyone who's heard this part one of this interview with sister carolyn and you're harboring some bitterness some pain some undealt with unforgiveness for the way you were treated in a particular relationship Know that we provide more answers next week, but today, let it go. Because when, when, when it says forgive someone, literally in a biblical sense, forgive means to release. So I'm telling you, let go in the sense of give whatever repercussions, judgments, thoughts that you have concerning someone who did you wrong or did not do what you thought they should do in a relationship give that over to god and know that he is not only a righteous judge but the same way that oftentimes you've done some shady things you've done some slick things you've done some disappointing things know that god understands and sees you and he's providing you an opportunity today to give someone the same chance that he's given you Have a wonderful day.